Glad you're here today. All right. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks and praise for another day. We thank you for the gift of life and the gift of Jesus Christ and his life. Lord, as we look at the truth of your word, we want it to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path so that we will honor you through our lives. Thank you, God, for the scouts that are here today, the influence their leaders have on them, and the impact they have on our culture and community and even our nation. Keep them safe. Bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can go ahead and take out your sermon notes, and every week I give to you uh, sermon notes to follow as well as seven-day devotional guide. We're in a series called Love Your Neighbor. We started it a couple of weeks ago, and for the first two weeks we looked at a very famous story in the Bible called the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we saw that, like in the story, we can have a tendency to be callous to people who are in need, who have issues, who are stranded, who are hurting. And sometimes prosperity keeps us from doing that because when everything's going good and we're having a great time, we get so caught up in our own lives, we tend to not necessarily intentionally ignore people, we just don't see them. And it takes something maybe like a September 11th that gets our attention. And if you remember when that that horrible day occurred. The next Sunday, churches were packed all across the nation. It has a way of bringing us back together to remind us what ultimately is important. And that's people, our relationship to God and our relationship to each other. And so we've been seeing that love is something we should be pursuing. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 this, let love be your highest goal in life. Jesus was so concerned that we get this down that he told a story in Luke's gospel that begins this way. He said there was a rich man whose lands produced a bountiful harvest. Now, I want you to notice there in your notes and what will be up on the screen in a minute, that passage is that the man didn't produce. The land is what produced that bountiful surplus. And Jesus says, listen, I want you to get this down. Love is the highest goal you should pursue. And this rich man, he had this huge profit. And he thought it was by his own hands. And God, through the story, teaches him a lesson. It kind of reminds me of a story I heard about an old man who was on his deathbed dying. And as he laid there with his eyes open, waiting peacefully for the inevitable end to come, he all of a sudden smelt coming up into his bedroom fresh baked chocolate chip cookies. And he thought, you know, if I can just get down there and get one chocolate chip cookie, I can die peacefully. So he forced himself out of bed. He crawled across the floor. He sat on each step coming down the steps. And he finally crawled into the kitchen. And there on the table was this warm, fresh batch of chocolate chip cookies. And as he shakingly reached up there to grab one, all of a sudden he felt, bam. Across his hand came this metal spatula, and it was his wife. She said to him, stop it. Therefore, the funeral. (laughs) You get it, don't you? Listen to the rest of this scripture here that Jesus tells, because God's spatula comes down on this man. He asked himself, what should I do? For I don't have enough space to share my goods. In other words, he's got so much going on. He's being blessed by God. He never thinks God's blessing him so he can share this with other people. Then he says, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll say to myself, I have so many good things stored up for me. Now rest, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This night your life will be demanded of you. And then to whom will all your things belong? Kind of like swap. The Bible says God killed him on the spot. This will be for anyone who stores up treasure for himself, but is not rich in what matters to God. I want you to circle that phrase, what matters to God. I did a little research. In 2019, do you know how much money Americans spent on these self-storage facilities? $40 billion. 2019, you know how much money Americans spent on the, mu- on the music industry? $20 million. We're spending twice the money to store stuff we don't have room for in our house. 
knows we're spending $40 billion a year as Americans to hoard stuff because we think it's ours. And this man in the story didn't realize what matters most to God, and that is that God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to other people. This guy only thought of himself. This is my stuff. You know, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything we have is a gift from God. This guy says, listen, I'm, I don't have enough room in my house. How many of you have ever watched that show, Hoarders? I pray for those people. I mean, they barely have a path they can walk through in their house. We, we amass all this stuff. And God, like this man, says, listen, I didn't bless you so that you could hoard this stuff. I gave this stuff to you so you could be a blessing to other people. So what does matter most to God? The Bible tells us in Galatians 5, 6. For when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, what is important is faith expressing itself in what? Love. God says what matters most is not your accomplishments. What matters most is not the degrees you get or the college you attended. What matters most is not the retirement accounts you have. What matters most is not the fame or achievements you have. What matters most is love. What is important is love through faith expressing itself to other people. So I want to give you some ideas, some points here on how to know you have genuine, authentic love. How do we know that our faith is expressing love? Paul says, let love be your highest goal. And so I don't want us to miss this. And between now and the Sunday before Easter, we're going to look at this issue of love. And I'm going to share some things with you that you don't know about love. We all have our idea of what love is. I'm going to teach you over the next few weeks what love really is. So let me share with you first this. If I don't live a life loving God and loving others, the Bible tells me nothing I say will matter. Nothing I say will matter. If I don't love God and I don't love others, it doesn't matter what I say. God says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and all the languages of angels, but I don't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. God says, words without love are just noise. They're nothing. You know, we're, as Americans, we're really impressed with great orators, great speakers, great communicators, uh, comedians who can hold our attention and make us laugh. God says, that doesn't matter to me at all. You can be the best communicator. You can have the best words. You can explain and be the best teacher in the world. But if you don't have love, it means nothing. So life without love, I don't get any credit for that. Number two, if I don't live a life of loving God and loving others, nothing I know will matter. I started school, kids, at six years of age, and I didn't finish school till 36. 30 straight years of school. Yes. Yes. But look what the Bible says. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. You may be the Phi Beta Kappa. You may be a member of Mensa. If you know what Mensa is, Mensa is an organization in America of the most elite intellectual people in the world. Okay? You may be a walking encyclopedia of Bible knowledge. You may be an expert or brilliant in math or literature or science. But if you don't have love, God says it doesn't count. I mean, think about this. We are smarter than any other generation before us, but we still have the same old problems, war, terrorism, crime, abuse, prejudice, hatred, and violence. And why? Because what the world needs is not more knowledge, it needs love. Without love, God says, I'm nothing, I get nothing for this. Number three, if I don't live a life loving God and loving others, nothing I believe will matter. There's a huge misunderstanding in the Christian faith, a lot of people think the Christian faith is about what you believe, knowing the right doctrine, knowing the right truth. Now, there is some element that we have to know the right truth and adhere to the right doctrine. But being a follower of Christ is more than that. It's more than what I know. It's more than what I believe. It's more than just accepting the right doctrine. Look what Paul writes in verse 2. If I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. So it takes more than belief. To please God. In fact, the Bible says this in James 2.19. You say that you have faith 
For you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. I mean, even the devil believes there's a God. He believes in God. He, has that, he knows that. Now, the devil's not going to be in heaven. Why? Because he doesn't have love. The issue is not whether you believe the right stuff. The issue is, do you love the people as you believe the right stuff? I'll be honest with you. We did a funeral here yesterday. And afterwards, a lady came up to me. And she hadn't been in church in years. But she wanted to talk to me because I had been very open and honest about my walk with Christ. And she said, you know, I was in church. I got out of church. And I got invited to a ladies' Bible study group. And I really didn't want to go. Because she said, I can't stand Christians. They're arrogant. They're judgmental. They're cocky. They think they're better than anybody else. And I thought, well, she's talking about me. <laughs> so I said, did you go? She said, yes, I went. She said, on the first night, the teacher said, listen, there are no contradictions in scriptures. And there's no inconsistencies. But if you think there are, the next week, bring those to our Bible study. Bring your questions. Bring to me what you think are inconsistencies and contradictions. She did. She showed up the next week. And the lady started the Bible study. And she raised her hand. She said, can I, can I ask a question? She said, what? She said, you said last week if we thought there were any contradictions in scriptures, or any inconsistencies in scripture, we could bring those questions tonight and we could ask them. She said, um, there are no inconsistencies. There's no contradictions in scripture. I advise you to go to another Bible study group. She's never been back to church. It doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter what you believe. If you don't love God and love people, you get no credit with God. Because even the demon believes. And at least he trembles in terror. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 20, if we say we love God but hate others, we are liars. For we cannot love God whom we have not seen if we do not love others whom we have seen. God says, you've never seen me. You say you, you believe in me, you love me. How can you treat people that you do see in a hateful, despiteful way? If you say you love me but you don't love the people around you, God says, you are a liar. You're just a liar. Number four. If I don't live a life of loving God and loving others, nothing I give will matter. If I don't live a life of loving God and loving others, it doesn't matter how much money I give, how much time I give. It doesn't matter. Verse 3 says this in 1 Corinthians 13. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, meaning I could be a martyr for Christ, I could boast about it, but I didn't love others, I would gain nothing. Can you be in a relationship for the wrong reasons? Yes. You can have the wrong motives. Absolutely. Because giving is not always, uh, loving is not always a requirement in giving. Some people give just in order to get something back. They're going, well, you know, I'll give you this. You know, we have this phrase, you scratch my back, what? Scratch your back. You give me something, I'll give you something. And that's all selfishness. That's not, that's not love. We do this all the time in our culture. Some people give out a guilt because they either didn't do something they should have done or they did something they regretted they had done. Parents do this a lot with their children. I see this a lot. Instead of spending time with their kids, they go buy them toys and trinkets and digital devices to keep them occupied because the parent simply feels guilty they're not giving the time to their children. Some people give to get prestige. Some people give to get glory or recognition or honor. Some people want that big placard that says, he gave the most to this institution. God says, if I give but I don't love, it's nothing. <laughs> I heard about a husband who said, um, I don't understand. I have bought my wife everything she could ever want, and she's still leaving me. And when I heard that, I thought, did you ever love your wife? You, can buy, you can't buy a wife. You can't buy your kids. You can bribe people, but you can't buy them. God says, if I give everything, but I don't have love, I get nothing for it. Number five, if I don't live a life loving God and loving others, nothing I accomplish will matter. We live in a culture of accomplishments, of recognition. We like to see to it that our ball teams are winning. We like to see to it that we're progressing in our work and our careers and we're getting rewarded for this. At school, we, we 
judge our children by how they perform on their tests. It's all about accomplishments and grades. But look what the Bible says. No matter what I say or what I believe or what I do, I am bankrupt without love. You can rack up an incredible list of accomplishments. You can be on the cover of Fortune magazine or People or Inc. You can have won the Nobel Peace Prize. But if you don't have love, God says you get nothing for it. You can have enormous accomplishments, build this huge entrepreneurial business. You can be successful at every level our culture says. But the Bible says you're, it's worth squat if we don't love God and love each other. Because God says, let love be your highest goal. Why? Because of what 1 John 4, 18 says, God is love. In other words, let God be your highest goal. And if you will love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, something we've looked at the last two weeks, and you love your neighbor as yourself, then God blesses your life. But it doesn't matter how smart you are, how much you accomplish, how much you give, how much you know, what you believe. If you don't do it with love, you get no credit with God from it. God says, I can have the eloquence of an orator, the knowledge of a genius, the faith of a miracle worker, the generosity of a philanthropist, but the achievements of a superstar. But if I don't have love in my heart, it's worth zero. It doesn't count. The only thing that matters to God is do I love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and do I love other people? One day you're not going to stand before God, and you're going to have an evaluation. He's going to do it. He's not going to judge you on how well you succeeded in your job. He's not going to say, all right, let's see all those degrees you got from college. Let's see your, your report cards that you got in school. He's not going to say, let's see your portfolio or your 401K. He's not going to say, bring me all your sports trophies for me to see what you did in sports. Or show me your resume. He's not going to say, I'm judging you on how many people follow you on Facebook or Instagram. God's going to evaluate your life on one thing. Did you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And did you love your neighbor as yourself? That's how you're going to be evaluated. God says, did you love me? Did you love other people? All this other stuff we think is so important is super flurious. God's going to say, I'm going to judge you on how well you loved. Remember that 1 Corinthians 14, one passage, make love your highest goal. The primary objective in your life and my life is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to get better at loving him every day that way. And the second goal, Jesus says, is equal to it. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. To get better at loving people. Now, we all around people all the time that get on our nerves. You may have ridden with one this morning. We all get on each other's nerves. The question is, will we still love them? Will we still be true to them? Will we give them the benefit of the doubt? Will we give them what they need rather than what they deserve? Because that's what Jesus Christ does for us. You know, love is a crazy word. We use love to express all kinds of things. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my job. Last night, Audrey's brother, we were, had to go to a family funeral. And after we got home, he brought us some fresh Krispy Kreme donuts. We say, I love Krispy Kreme. We use this word in so many ways, but really, we do not know what it means. We have love letters, and we have love songs. We have love stories. But have you ever noticed no one ever really stops to define what love is? I went to World Book Encyclopedia to see how World Book would define love. They had one little line, love. And after that, it said, see, get this, sex and emotions. World Book wouldn't even attempt to define love. So in the encyclopedia, if you look up emotion, it gives you that definition. That got me thinking, why do we know more about sex than we know about love? Your middle school students know more about sex than they know about love. I went and looked up the article about emotion and had about a page and a half. I looked at the page about sex, three and a half pages about sex. Only four times did it mention love, but it never defined it. Isn't that so typical of us? We use the word, but we really don't know what it means. I don't think most people know what love means according to God. Almost all the love songs that we hear, they're love songs that really not love songs. They're really lust songs. They're about, you give me something, I'll give you something. You know, when a guy says to a woman, if you love me, you'll let me. Here's what she should say to him. If you love me, you'll wait. 
Love can't wait to give, but lust can't wait to get. In 2001, there was a rapper. I'm not into rap, but I did a little research for this series. I've never heard of this guy. His name is Ja Rule. Anyway, his album sold over 3 million copies. It was the top of the list for several months. So I thought, well, what was this album about? I'll go look it up. I mean, somebody sells 3 million copies, and it's at the top, and everybody's listening to what was it about. And it was supposed to be, the title was, Pain is Love. Think about, do you think pain is love? So I looked at some of his songs and read some of the lyrics. It ain't about love. It's about sexual violence, the enjoyment of rape, taking advantage of your sexual partner. His lyrics are laced with pornographic expressions and anger. It's about getting stuff for yourself and giving nothing in return. Ja Rule knows zip about love. But yet it was the number one album in 2001 for several months in a row, sold three million copies. So what is love? I'm so glad you asked. And over the next few weeks between now and the Sunday before Easter, I'm going to walk you through what love is. We all have an idea, but we really don't know what it is. So for this morning, let me give you a few things about what love is. Number one, what is love according to God in Scripture? First of all, love is a command. God commands that we love each other. It's not an option if we are part of the family of faith. And if we don't do it, the Bible says we are committing sin. Look what the Bible says in 2 John 1, 6. Love means doing what God has commanded us, and he has commanded us to love one another. I've heard people say, well, I can live without love. No, you can't. You can exist without love, but you can't live without love. God has commanded us to love each other. There's several misunderstandings about love. Here's the first misunderstanding people say. They say love is a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Remember that song that came out years ago? Feelings. All I want are feelings. Remember that song? Love's not a feeling. It creates feelings. It conjures up feelings, but it's not a feeling. And here's why. You can't command a feeling. You ever had a child that was just throwing a temper tantrum or was upset and crying? <laughs> and you look at them and say, stop crying. <laughs> they can't. You can't command a feeling. You can't. God wouldn't tell us, God wouldn't give us a commandment about something we can't control. So love is not a feeling. Feelings cannot be commanded. But love can be commanded. Love creates feelings. It causes feelings. It produces feelings. But love is not a feeling. Love is an emotion. And many times you don't have control over your emotions. You're driving down College Road. Somebody pulls in front of you. Most of you do not say, bless you, brother. You, you have a reaction inside of you. you didn't, it just happened. We can't always control our emotions. So God wouldn't give us a command about something we can't control. Look what John 13 says from Jesus. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Notice what Jesus says. He doesn't say your good deeds will prove to the world. He doesn't say your accomplishments will prove to the world. He doesn't say your perfect church attendance will prove to the world. He doesn't say any of that. He says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're mine. And this is why we are commanded to love. Look what the Bible says in 1 John 2, 4. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. God says, you can have all the accomplishments you want, but if you don't love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you're a liar. There's no truth in you. We are commanded to love. Here's the second thing I know about love. Love is a choice. I remember when I proposed to Audrey, Elaine, 
I'm not always the most elegant. And I remember saying to her in this proposal, I had this wonderful diamond ring to give to her. Now, ladies, you're going to think this is so romantic. You're going to think, man, he did it. He nailed it. I said to her, I am choosing to love you. She went, what? You're choosing to love me. Love is a choice. And through 33 years of marriage, both of us have come to understand that love is a choice. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it because it does. I want you to circle a phrase there. Go after a life of love. Your life depends on this. We can choose to love or not love. So the first misunderstanding people have about love, they say love is a feeling. Here's the second misunderstanding people have about love. We think that love is uncontrollable. Wrong. Love is controllable. It's kind of like as if one day I'm just walking down the street and all of a sudden I get hit with love. I mean, even the terminology we, we used to say, I fell in love. Like I fell in a ditch or something. I mean, I fell in love. I fell in love. I've fallen in love and I can't get up, you know? We act like we have no control over this. I can't tell you how many times I've had a man or woman come and talk to me and try to justify a separation or a a potential divorce by saying, I just don't love him or I just don't love her anymore. No. You need to say, I'm choosing not to love him. I'm choosing not to love her. Love is a choice. And you can keep to choose to love or not to love, no matter who it is. It's a choice, Scripture says. Acting in love when you don't feel like it is even a better proof of love. I told you a few weeks ago, there are times Audrey and I have had a little arguments. And my wife is real passionate when she gets mad. I mean, you never question if she's angry. But she'll just be going, I'm just kind of standing there like a little kid in the schoolyard. And she goes, but I love you. She never fails to tell me that she loves me, even when she's mad at me. Love chooses to love. Love chooses to do things when it's not okay. How many of you have ever gotten up in the middle of the night with a sick kid? When that kid throws up on you, I mean, they just hurl it everywhere. It's coming out both ends. That's love, to clean that kid up. My wife, as her mother got older, ended up, we kept downsizing her, and finally she went to assisted living. And my wife would go every day to see her mom. I would go several times a week to see her. Here's what love is. It's taking an aging parent who's getting dementia, who doesn't always have control over their bodily functions, bathing them and cleaning them up. That's love. That's love. That's saying to that parent, you know, that we're commanded in Scripture, honor your father and your mother, how? All the days of what? Your life, not their life. That's love. But it's easier, isn't it, to not do certain things. We don't like to be inconvenienced. So love is giving a person what they need, what they deserve. Listen, if God didn't give me what I needed, If he gave me what I deserve, I wouldn't even be here today. God has given us what we needed, not what we deserve. It's called grace. And he says, listen, as I give you grace, and I give you grace, and I give you grace, and I give you grace, I expect you to give grace to other people. I think for a lot of times in relationships, we get upset about some of the stupidest things. Who cares which way the toilet paper flips? But it, you laugh, it has been listed In divorce papers. Yeah, you laugh. But some people make a big deal. Does it come over or does it come under? We get upset about some of the stupidest things. And we would rather ruin a relationship. Because we're so selfish. Here's the third thing about love. Love is a conduct. Meaning it's a behavior. It's an action. It's something people can see. 1 John 3, 18 says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. So love is not something you feel. Love is not something you say. Love is something you do. It's an activity that people can see. It's measurable. It's more than talk. There's walk. It's more than a Hallmark card. 
is something you do. Love is accepting the weaknesses, and failures, and shortcomings in people. Love says, hey, I'm going to take care of this cerebral palsy child that we have. And I'm going to love this child. I'm going to treat this child just like I would treat all my other children. That's love. Did you know that every minute of the day God is putting around you, right in front of you, right under your noses, opportunities to grow in love? And as I said the last two weeks, I don't think it's because we are uncaring. I think it's just we're so busy. Our lives and our schedules are so full. It's all about achievements. We've got all these things we've got to do for work or school. And it's not that we're trying to intentionally ignore people, but we're so preoccupied we don't see them. And therefore, we miss these opportunities to grow in love. They'll never come back again. I mean, how many times have you thought, I need to write a letter to that person? Or I need to make that phone call. I need to send that thank you note. Or I need to go next door and see how my neighbor's doing. But you got so busy, you forgot and you lost the opportunity. Love is a conduct. It's something that we do. Here's the fourth thing about love. Love is a commitment. Love is a command. Love is a choice. Love is a conduct. But love is also a commitment. In 1 John 4, 16, the Bible says this. God is love, and if we keep on loving others, we will stay one in our hearts with God, and he will stay one with us. I want to just circle the phrase, keep on a loving. Love is a commitment. And the Bible says our relationship to God is primarily affected by how we treat each other. Love is durable. It's to keep on going. It's to keep on going like the Energizer battery bunny. It doesn't stop. And if you want to learn how to love the way God wants you to learn, I promise you, you're going to be tested in this. God's going to put people around you. I tell you all the time, we want, we want people to love us. The way God grows love in you is to put you around unloving people. At our church, we call them EGRs, extra grace required. These are people who know how to push your buttons. They know exactly how to get under your skin. When I was working on this, I thought about a contemporary Christian singer who was here recently in October. He was the performer for the Franklin Graham Crusade that was going around the country. His name is Jeremy Camp. And Jeremy Camp started young singing for God. And one day he was on stage at a very young age. He's around 19 or 20. And he looked over and one of the backup singers was a, a young woman named Melissa Lynn Henning. And she just had her hands up in the air, and she was just praising God and singing her heart out. And he said, he looked over, and he said, I just thought, I love her. He never even met her. He just thought, I love her. So he decided to tell her. After the concert, he went over to her and said, I, I, I love you. Now, she'd never met him. She says, well, I don't feel the same way to you. And that kind of crushed him. But several months later... He got a phone call from her with some very devastating news. She'd been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. He said, I remember walking into the hospital and she had just found out she had the cancer and she was smiling. And I was like, why is she smiling? And Melissa said, I'm doing okay. I've been thinking about this. If I die from this cancer... That really isn't the issue. But if one person can come to know Jesus Christ as a result of my death, it will be worth it. Jeremy Camp said he left the hospital. He got in the car and he was driving home. He said, what kind of woman is this that loves God that much? That even if she dies, she hopes people come to know Christ through it. And then he said, Lord, he said, I don't even know why I prayed this. He said, Lord, if she will tell me she loves me, I'll marry her anyway. He got home, and about two weeks later, he got a phone call, and it was Melissa. She said, God has allowed me to have some time to think and to pray about the cancer and about what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. She says, as I've been praying, God has put within my heart a deep love for you, and I love you. Well, they began to date for five months. She began to get Radiation and cancer treatment for her cancer, and all seemed well. And on October 21st, 2000, they got married. He was 23 and she was 21. They go away for their honeymoon. 
But while they're on their honeymoon, she begins to have some stomach problems. And they thought maybe it's just something she'd eaten. But to make sure they came back after the honeymoon, he took her to the hospital. And the doctors ran all their tests, and they came back out, and they said to Jeremy, he said, listen, the cancer's back. We thought we got it all, but it's back. And Jeremy said, I looked at her, all right, what are we going to do? They said, Jeremy, you don't understand. There's nothing we can do. It has spread through her entire body. She has weeks, maybe months to live. Jeremy Kemp says, I remember Melissa saying after the doctors broke the bad news, she said, Jeremy, I don't want to focus on dying. I want to focus on loving God and loving you. Would you pull out your guitar and let's just sing praises to God right now. Jeremy Kemp said they spent the last months of her life just praising God, not focusing on the circumstances, not focusing on the cancer, but focusing on that what matters most is loving God and loving other people. And on February 5th, 2001, Melissa died. And Jeremy went through a period of depression. And from that, he wrote a song called I Still Believe. And on March 3rd, you'll be able to go see a movie made on this. March 13, called I Still Believe about his life and this woman he had been married to. He married her even knowing she could die of cancer. There are times none of us are the most loving person. You can talk to my wife. You can talk to my daughter. There are times I'm not most, the most loving person. Yesterday, I had to apologize to Emmy about something. You get pressured, you get worked up, you got so much stress on you, all of a sudden you say something, you do something, you didn't mean it, but it just comes out. You just do it. And I think all of us need to work on being more loving. Listen to me, when a doctor tells you you've got weeks or months to live, I promise you what you are not going to be thinking is, can I still go to work and become employee of the year? That's not what you're going to be thinking. You're going to focus on loving God and loving people. So let me give you five little applications to wrap up with that you can begin today as we work our way through this series. Here's the first thing you can begin to do. Learn God's perspective on how mature love acts and responds. Personal change always starts with changing ourselves. It involves Understanding God's perspective on love. What does God say love is? What does he say is love? In 1 John 4, 7, it says love comes from God because God is love. So you need to start getting into this book, learning about what love really is. Number two, how do you build a life of real deep love? Start your day with a daily scriptural reminder to love. My wife is great at putting up post-it notes. Reminded me to do this, to do this, to do this. Most of you know, last September I had a little stroke. It wasn't anything major, but I had a little stroke. Okay. And I learned in that stroke, maybe a couple of years earlier, I had a previous stroke. Didn't even know that one. And Audrey thought several years ago I was getting dementia, early Alzheimer's, because I was forgetting some things. And we found out that first stroke occurred in the memory part of my brain. So I got a few little memory cells that are gone. She'll show a picture or something. I'm in it. We're with these people. But I have no memory of it. So she helps put little post-it notes. On the counter when I come down in the morning. Don't forget to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. I mean, we're, we're keeping post-it in business, okay? All right? But it's also a way for her to love me. Because she knows that I may forget something. It's just her way to help me, to, to remind me of what to do. So one of the things you could do is just put a little post-it note of a verse from God about love. You could put it on your cell phone. We all have these little phones. You can put it in your notes section to remind you. You can have it pop up throughout the day, reminding you to be a loving person. That says, God, remind me to, to love you today. Remind me to love people. If nothing else, I get done today. Let me end the day by loving you more and loving other people. First John 4, 8 says, anyone who does not love does not know God. If we don't love people, we can't see how can we love God whom we have not seen. And the Bible is full of verses on this. You can Google it. I have people ask me, what verse? Google it. You got a computer. Look up verses. Just type verses about love from the Bible. It'll give you a bunch. Here's the third thing you can do. You can start memorizing Bible verses about what God says about love. 
You need to memorize Bible verses. This book here called Scripture is full of truths and applications for life that will get you through every situation in life. And when you're in a situation where you're being tempted to be unloving or you're tempted to be jealous or fearful or impatient or judgmental, critical, you're going to have those situations all day come towards you. And I promise you, most of you don't carry a Bible with you everywhere you go. You don't. It's sitting at home. And all of a sudden something happens, your first inclination isn't to think of verse. Start memorizing verses about love from God's word. God will bring that verse to your mind. Look what the Bible says in Psalm 119. David writes this. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How does this relate to love? We're commanded to love. God's going to allow situations to come in your life to test that. Number four, how do I build a life of real love and deep love? Practice acting in unselfish, loving ways. Love's like a muscle. you got to keep working it. Practice makes perfect. Let me ask you this. How many of you, the very first time, very first time you ever got behind a wheel of a car to drive, you were an expert driver? Emmy told me that when she took driver's training for the very first time, she's in that seat to drive. She said she was doing two miles an hour, and she thought she was doing 100. I mean, you can walk faster than two miles an hour. Okay? And over time, as you practice that driving, practice that driving, you got better at it. You weren't an expert driver the first time you got behind a wheel. You were cautious. You were guarded. You were careful. It, it felt awkward at first. Because what do I push? Which is the gas? Which is the brake? And now with the smart cars, you just got a button you push. And if you don't have your key with you, you're in trouble because you won't start. You know what I'm talking about? I'll go out the house and forget the keys all the time. And I go to my top. And I go back in the house. Okay? And now I have a rental. It actually has a key. When they first got me this rental, I, got in and I kept trying to push a button. And I forgot it had a key. When you first do anything, it's awkward. It, it, it's uncomfortable. But you've got to practice it. Practice makes perfect. Jesus said this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Circle those words. Put, puts them into practice. You've got to put this into practice. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. If you don't put this into practice, it's like building your house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great fall. But everyone who does this puts it into practice is the one who built his house on the rocks. To become a loving person, it takes practice. You have to do it over and over. It's not going to seem natural to love people who push your buttons. As a pastor, I've been in this about my whole life. I went to NC State. I majored in chemistry. I didn't. I never saw myself doing this. Never. People would tell me, and I'd laugh at them, said, no, I've been in, been in church too long. I know how they treat preachers. I never saw myself doing this. And through my life, I've had people who've been the biggest encouragers, and I have people who have stabbed me in the back. But I still love them all. It takes practice. And the greatest example is Jesus, who went through the worst horrendous thing of anybody. Arrested, beaten, scourged, crucified, but yet still from the cross, he said the most loving thing, Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. And one of the best ways to do this is our next point. Get support from people who are loving people. So number five, how can you get better at this? Get support from people who are, are loving people. There are some people who have been doing this longer than you. They, they know how to love. They know how to love difficult people, challenging people. And this is why I'm big about our connect groups, our small groups. If you're not in one, one of the best ways to grow in this, to get practice, is get into a connect group, a small group. Because you're not going to be with your family. You're going to be with people who are from different walks of life. We have Sunday school classes. We have home groups that you can be a part of. God will help you learn how to practice this. Ephesians 5, 2 puts it this way. Keep company with God and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. That's what love is. It's giving everything. 
And you have to push against your fear. I remember when I was thinking about getting married. I never, because of my whole life I grew up in, I just thought I'll never, I'll never marry. And having gone to a counselor for several years, and he encouraged me to take the risk. I had to push against that fear. We saw this verse last week. Perfect love cast out fear. It cast out fear. The word for expel there is the word means to hurl. Love and fear cannot exist at the same time. It's kind of like when the house is on fire and there's a child in the house. The parent runs into that house without thinking about anything of their safety. They're going to save that child. Our soldiers who go to battle, it's not that they're not afraid. They push against that fear. They say to you and they say to me, on my watch, I will keep America safe. It's not that they're not afraid. They're scared. But they push that fear out. And when you learn and begin to love like God loves, then you'll have no fear. Why? Because fear is from the devil. Fear is about yourself. God is love, and he casts out that fear. God causes you to love people who are difficult to love. Our last verse is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Love. So I have a question for you. Will I obey God to risk loving people like God commands? You're going to be tested this week. You may not have pulled out of the driveway here, and you're going to get tested. I want our church to be known as the most loving church in Wilmington. I want people, when they drive by here, they go, if you want to be loved, that's the church you go to. That church knows how to love God, and they know how to love people. Let's pray.